I wasn't really quite sure how to pitch tonight. Was it going to be a, a homily, speaking of peace and reconciliation? Was it going to be a sermon, speaking of Christian witness? Was it going to be on advocacy, speaking of our need to stand by our brethren in countries like Syria, Egypt, throughout the Middle East, and even throughout Africa and the world? In actual fact, it's going to be a combination of all of those. Because as Christians, we cannot divide ourselves. We are who we are. As Christians, as followers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we follow his lead and in his footsteps as an advocate, not only for his own followers, but as an advocate for humanity. As someone who stood up for rights, as someone who defended the downtrodden, the marginalized, the alienated, as someone who in the midst of that brought hope, not only flagging up the challenges, but demonstrating the power and the hope of the message that he himself brought. And that in itself is what Christianity brings to the world. We sometimes think of Christianity just as a following and forget that it is bound and founded in the person of Christ himself. As a protagonist of equality, of freedom, one who came to preach the good news and to be the good news, one who came to free the oppressed and the chained and the imprisoned and himself be a ransom and be one who was willing to pay the price that all may be set free. And until today in the Middle East, followers of Christ are called to pay that price. And like their master, like our Lord, pay that price even until death. Unfortunately, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here, so I'm sorry I need to state the obvious, but many people in our world today forget or are oblivious to the fact that Christianity started in the Middle East. Christianity came to the West from the East and came not only with incredible power, but at an incredible price. If we look at the way our Lord started his ministry, he said to his disciples that they should witness to him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and indeed to the end of the world. And that is why we are here today. That is why some of us in this room will be believers today. Because of that, not only ethos or philosophy, but that very real message of salvation that came into the world through the Middle East and spread. We see an incredible witness throughout the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then through him, through the witness of his own disciples and the apostles, who went to every place in the world through their own ministry and through that of their disciples. There was such an enrichment of the world through the presence of Christ, the incarnate word, the only one who could change the world because he created it the only one who could advocate for and transform humanity because he created it. And the only one who could stand in that place, in that gap, and transform that which was fallen into that which was victorious because he had created it. 
So today we celebrate that. And we celebrate those who spread that word. Those who continue to spread it until today. We see a growth of Christianity and looking at Egypt for many, many centuries, up to the end of the first millennium, there is a record of at least 80% of Egyptians being Christian. With the entry of Islam in the seventh century and a very sometimes aggressive process of change, we suddenly saw that number drop to about 18%, which is the number that is still exists today. Although there was that incredible following of Christ manifest in Christians in those first centuries, we unfortunately have seen such an exodus of Christians from the Middle East that now amounts to a presence of about 5%. It's, it's alarming. Don't forget that Christians in the Middle East were the source of so much. And I hope I'm not offending anyone, but I'm not flying the Christian flag here. I'm just telling you what many of you already know. I'm not trying to prove that Christianity is better than anything else. That is a decision for each and every person to make on his or her own assessment. But the facts are before us. The facts that our Lord Jesus Christ came and was a reconciling factor in humanity and called us through the teachings of St. Paul as well to reconcile as ministers of reconciliation. Just last, uh, just last month, many of us witnessed a horrific event in Egypt. After the clearing of demonstrations in Cairo, some, after instigation, after very hateful rhetoric, decided to go and attack about 50 churches in the space of 48 hours. If you listen to conspiracy theorists, and they are very few and far between in the Middle East, as you all know, you don't find many of them around, some would say that that was an intentional action so that Christians would retaliate, and in retaliating, then have a spiral of aggression and a spiral of violence that would further destabilize Egypt. But what actually happened was not merely out of character for humanity. It was miraculous. Not a single act of vengeance. Not a single act of retaliation. It's inhuman. To the extent that when Pope Toadros was asked, what are you going to do? And I mentioned this at our NATO service at St. Margaret's Westminster um, just last week. What are you going to do? Absolutely nothing. What are we going to do? We are going to bear this cross as we have, as we have borne the cross for centuries. We are going to continue to witness in a spirit of love and reconciliation and forgiveness and embracing all as we have for centuries. We are going to continue to be light in darkness to break that darkness as we have for centuries. And that is actually what happened. That spiral never took off. That spiral was never given the opportunity. That seed of hatred was never given the chance to grow. Because there was a reaction with grace. And many commentators, political commentators, Muslim political commentators, have commented and said that that act of restraint 
by Egyptian Christians was the stabilizing act that settled all of the destabilizing elements that wanted to affect Egypt. Because the domino effect never took off. And so people were confused. One uh, Muslim commentator on her current affairs program said, Christians, you've confused us. Please do something, retaliate, be angry, speak spitefully, complain, raise your voice, do something. We've not only seen this in Egypt, and I feel very guilty now when I go to places and they tell me they are praying for Egypt. As much as I appreciate their prayers, I also realize that we have been so blessed and fortunate when we consider the plight of our brothers and sisters in Syria. When we consider the horrific things that are happening there. I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to sit on either side of the fence. But the truth is the truth. Humanity is valuable. Christian or Muslim, religious or secular. And there must be action on every side to safeguard humanity and human life. There must be action on every side to assure those who are there that they are still valued and protected. The question tonight is what happens in the West here where we live so comfortably? Yes, we are tormented sometimes for being Christians. We are even persecuted. And my, my dear friend, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, um, had some words to say about that in a recent interview. We shouldn't really speak about what we face here as persecution in comparison to what we see so many people facing in Egypt, in Syria, in Nigeria, in so many places in the world. But even here, sitting in the West, what is the effect going to be on us? When you uproot people from their place, from their origin, and you take them away, you not only destabilize them, but you destabilize their communities. The reason I started speaking about reconciliation, I know that's very close to the hearts of some of my dear friends here. The reason I started speaking about reconciliation is that the presence of Christians has always been a reconciling factor, historically and in the present, in the Middle East. And that reconciling factor, if you take it out, suddenly destabilizes, suddenly pulls out a very significant ingredient. Those of you who study the Middle East and know the Middle East know that it has its own very specific, and some would say peculiar, dynamics. Somehow it works. It doesn't follow any particular theory. It doesn't have any particular model. It is just, at the best of times, organized. At the worst of times, haphazard mayhem. But it works. And the communities know how to deal with it. How do you orchestrate, whether it's a million or 10 million or 30 million, numbers aren't important. How do you orchestrate that many people in Egypt to react and come out and say, we don't want the person we elected, but who didn't deliver? Yes, was he democratically elected? For all intents and purposes, yes. There were some who will say it was orchestrated, it was, it was fixed, that boat has sailed, and people accepted that former President Morsi was president. But I want to challenge people who spent so much of our valuable time considering whether this was a coup or not. I want to ask them, if our own Prime Minister here had done 1% of what that then president did in Egypt, here in the United Kingdom, 
what would happen? In the space of 12 months, 12 months, unemployment soared, inflation soared. There were fuel shortages, power cuts, crime was tenfold, abductions, threats, kidnappings, murders, vigilantes. It was total mayhem. Were people supposed to wait for another three years just so they could honor the democratic process? that was imposed of a model that doesn't even belong in the region. Is that what we want to do? Is that what we think is right? Is that what theorists and politicians and, and academics are going to tell people how they should live? Let us listen to people. Let us listen to the Syrians in their plight. And rather than sitting from a high place and imposing what we think is right, let us listen to them and see what they want. Let us listen to Egyptians. Let us listen to Iraqis, to Libyans, to everyone. Because it is people who actually orchestrate their own future. It cannot be imposed externally. If we try to impose things externally, and it leads to an even greater drain from the Middle East where Christians leave even more, then we are going to suffer here. We are going to suffer first because these people are not where they belong. And they will stop enriching us from where they have enriched us for the past centuries. We've received that blessing. We've received blessings Monastic movements, ecumenical movements. Ladies and gentlemen, interreligious dialogue did not start after September 11 or July 7. It started 1,300 years ago when it became a reality in people's lives. And that is the model that we should be taking, not exporting models, let's import models. But if those models cease to be, how can we import them? And then the harsh reality, and dare I use the T word, terrorism. It is going to happen. We know now that if we act in certain ways, as the West, and this is great for me, I can sort of change hats, besides the obvious, of course, and speak East and West. So I'm speaking now as someone who, who, who is British. If we impose our own brand of freedom and philosophy and export that, we're going to import lots of people who really don't like what we've done and will make every attempt and take every opportunity to let us know. There is much that can be done. I am so grateful today that the President of the United States decided yesterday that military intervention was not really called for right now in Syria, but that they would send materials and equipment that would help people in the face of chemical warfare which is a decision that our own government here in the United Kingdom had taken weeks ago. So we're thankful for that. We should stop thinking that people over there in those developing countries need our wisdom. Maybe we can import some of theirs. Rather than feeling that we must save them from this backwardness and corruption that they live in, let us learn from now how they have dealt with those things. Let us learn and be inspired by. Because if they stop being there, then we cannot be inspired by their example. We cannot be encouraged that even if we face persecution here, compared to what they are doing there, we're still okay, we'll still survive. We need to encourage people to be who they are. 
It's incredible that when we speak about child psychology and counseling now, that we are told we should not ever tell anyone what to do, but let them take their own decisions. Apparently, it doesn't work with international politics. <laughs> not quite sure how. So today, I stand before you, not as a politician, because I'm not. Not as a political theorist or analyst, because I'm not. I stand before you as a minister of God in his church, bringing a message of reconciliation. I want to close with a verse and a wonderful passage that I feel expresses so perfectly the state of the Christians in the Middle East. Our verse, and I'm sorry if you're bored of me using this one, but I just find it really inspiring. I'm going to keep using it. it comes from the second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. St. Paul says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Forsaken, but not struck down. We are not destroyed. But we carry about in the body the dying of the Lord, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body as well. It is only through that witness that we become victorious. We have seen victory proclaimed in the Middle East. And of course, we can't speak without mentioning our two dear archbishops who were abducted in Syria, uh, Yusuf Zidigi and uh, Yazigi, sorry, and Yohanna Ibrahim. And Metropolitan Yohan Ibrahim is a, is a dear friend of mine, I own personally. But through their communities, we've seen witness. And in their communities, we see a continuous presence. And now I share with you a passage from Ken Curtis, who says, on the surface, early Christians appeared powerless and weak. They were an easy target for scorn and ridicule. They had no great financial resources, no buildings, no social status, no government approval, no respect from educators. He goes on to say, when they became separated from the synagogues, they had even less inst institutional support. Then he goes on to say, but what finally mattered was not what they did not have, but what they have. And I close with this because our brothers and sisters in the Middle East still have this until today. I'm going to be visiting Cairo on, on, at the end of this week for a very brief meeting. And I am there to be inspired by an example that we will be hopefully using here. He goes on to say, but what finally mattered was not what they did not have, but what they have. They have faith. They have fellowship. They have a new way of life. They have confidence that their Lord was alive in heaven and guiding their daily lives. Do we have that strength of faith here today? Affliction brings faith. He goes on to say, these were the important things, and it made the difference in laying the Christian foundation, not only there, but in all the Western countries. So if we want to build on that foundation, we must honor these people and understand that their presence where they are is essential. As Coptic Christians, we refuse to use the word diaspora because 90% of Coptic Christians still live in Egypt. It is still the, Christ, the, the biggest Christian presence in the Middle East. And I say it flippantly sometimes, I say it with humor sometimes, but I say it with all my heart. We're not going anywhere. We are the indigenous people of Egypt who are tied to their Lord, 
who used Egypt as a place of refuge. And so the witness that has lived there, long may it live on and be an inspiration. And the witness we see in Syria, we see in Iraq, we see in Libya, we see in Nigeria, we see in so many places. Let us long be inspired by what we see and live what we learn. Thank you. I'd rather stay silent after that. Where to start? I remember in the year 2000 when I came to Holy Trinity Sloan Square. I preached a sermon and I said in the sermon which shocked the congregation at that time that I ask Christians today everywhere is there anything we believe in that we are ready to die for and at that time the people felt it was a bit too much and they told me so as the people of Holy Trinity do and some of you are from Holy Trinity <clears throat> and and I said it and because I believed it I believed this is a question that every Christian needs to answer when Jesus Christ came amongst us in the Middle East was born in Syria, not under Big Ben, unfortunately, and not under the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building. And we forget this fact often. When he came, he had this question in his mind. Am I here for something I believe in so much that I am happy and ready to die for. The Awareness Foundation is now 10 years old. With the support of His Holiness, His Grace, and a lot of friends and supporters and wonderful people, we continue to serve the Church of Christ in this country and beyond, in the Middle East and in North America. And in the 10 years of ministry, I never forgot, in one minute, I never, ever, I've never forgot this question. Do I believe in something that I'm ready to die for? You know why? Because as Sinjin said in the introduction, I lived in the war, in the civil war, firsthand for seven years, from 81 to 88 in Beirut. And in Beirut, we saw and heard more than the whole Middle East lived for centuries. And dear friends from Lebanon are here, and they can tell you how the horror Lebanon went through. And one of them is this military intervention from outside, which devastated the country. We, we spent a lot of time recently debating in this country and in the, in the United States whether we intervene, we strike, or we do not strike. And I felt so, so sad because the question is wrong for me. The question, the energy is spent in the wrong direction because the question shouldn't be whether we strike 
or we do not strike. Because the question itself points out to a sad fact that we do not learn from history. And we should learn from history. And the history tells us that such strikes never worked and never ended any war in history. I remember in 1984, the night that New Jersey, the battleship New Jersey, striked the hills of Beirut. No Lebanese, no human being in Beirut or in Lebanon would forget that night. New Jersey turned night into a daylight, bombarding Lebanon, as one journalist put it, the world did not see since the Second World War. Did that end the war in Lebanon by bombarding Lebanon with a battleship? It added only bloodshed, violence. It added only devastation to the country. And the, con the, the war continued. The Christians in Syria do not need now any protection from the West. And I say it loud and clear. Before you look at me with big eyes, I do not represent, and I'm not talking in the, in the name of Christians in the Middle East, but my feeling as a Christian from there, we do not need the protection of the West because the West has never protected us as Christians. What we need is the recognition of the world to the dirty game of politics which is exercised in the Middle East at the moment. No country has the right to say I'm intervening or I am the one who is going to protect the Christians in the Middle East. Thank you very much, we do not need that. We are bearing our cross ourselves. The Christians in the Middle East, the Christians in Syria, are bearing the heaviest cross you can ever imagine. Because the atrocities that have been committed are beyond your imagination. However your imagination could go wild, and how many horror movies you have seen in your life, what happened in Syria exceeded that. I'm standing before you with broken heart, with bleeding heart, because the stories we've heard, the things happened in Syria, is a shame will follow humanity forever. The world is watching. The world is creating one excuse after the other not to solve the conflict in Syria. My involvement with the Foreign Office in this country was not a happy time at all. I felt my intelligence was insulted again and again and again by silly excuses and empty words that no human being with a bit of intelligence could believe. If we talk about revolution, then Jesus Christ is the biggest revolutionist in the world. Don't, don't teach me about revolution. If we're talking about religion, we have kept Christianity alive for 2,000 years in the Middle East and in Syria. Don't teach me how to keep my, real, my faith in the, in the time of, of crisis. What I need from you is not to be ashamed of your actions later. And I tell you, the whole world will be ashamed of the way the world treated 
the Middle East, and more specifically, Syria, and more specifically, the minorities in Syria. According to the UN, over 50,000 foreigners are fighting in Syria in the name of Islam. 50,000 foreigners. They don't know what they are fighting about. They are waiting for the virgins in, in, in paradise. And we are bearing the fruits of that. And we are, we are carrying this cross, not anyone else in the world. Forgive me if I sound not so nice and kind. And Jesus Christ was merciful, but strong. We carry our cross with courage. We carry our cross not as weak people, but as people who know their message in their country. And as Christians in Syria, we know we have a role to play in this country, Syria, and in the Middle East. And we are not going to compromise this role, as His Grace said. We insist to stay there. And I add my voice to his grace voice. We're not going anywhere. We are staying there because we are not imported. We are not brought from somewhere to Syria. For 700 years, Syria was Christian. And the West forgets that the road to Damascus was Paul, not King Arthur and Damascus was Damascus not Camelot and sometimes in the West people think that Damascus and Egypt the Pharaoh Egypt and Damascus is some fantasy land in the Bible mentioned in the Bible but I tell you Paul or Saul was coming to Damascus as a terrorist. Let's name the things in their names. He entered Syria as a terrorist, persecuting, that what his aim was, to persecute the Christians in Damascus. And he went in the city and left it as a saint. He came to Syria as a terrorist. He left Syria as a saint. This is not a fantasy, my friends. This is reality. Because of that, we are all on the road to Damascus. We are all, all the world is responsible to lead the way to solve the conflict in Syria. And enough excuses and enough side distraction like the chemical weapon distraction, which is, was really very exciting plot. Very exciting. The chemical weapon, suddenly the chemical weapon came right in the center. Tell me something. 200,000 people in Syria are killed so far. And some hundred people were killed by chemical weapons. The 200,000s, are they children of a lesser God? Is my life only valuable to the world when I'm killed through a chemical weapon? And if I was shot or bombarded or stabbed or tortured to death, I am, the act is still in the parameters of the international law. Don't forget that. But once we use the chemical weapon, we are outside the frame of the international law. And then the world is, has waken up suddenly. My friends, this is an insult to our humanity. An insult to our intelligence. Jesus Christ taught us how to love our culture how to respect our culture, how to understand our culture. You know why? In order to transform it. And by bearing the cross in Syria, 
We are proving that we love our culture and our country. We respect our country. We understand our culture and our society. And through bearing this cross, we want to transform it. Let's not sing praises about democracy, because I am really fed up with that. I'm opening my heart to you this evening. Democracy is like an elastic band, or like the English saying, how long is a piece of string? Don't you say that? So, so what is democracy? It's, it's a, such an ambiguous, vague, um, big, small, square, triangle shape concept. You do whatever you do with it. This country took 500 years to journey into the democracy we have today. We call it democracy. But does the democracy here look like the democracy in Germany? No, you don't have a chancellor. Do you have president like America? No. So every country has its own model which emerged from the culture, emerged from the structure, the social fabric of the country. But to take any, any kind of what we call democracy and try to impose it somewhere in the world and fight for it and cause havoc in the country in the name of a word nobody can define in the whole world is madness because it didn't work. Look at Iraq. Do you think now Iraq has a democracy? Well, cuckoo land. <laughs> what democracy are we talking about in Iraq? Where are the Christians in Iraq? 90% of the Christians in Iraq left the country. And the country is facing chaos. And the West entered Iraq with the admission of all the West, without even a plan to, to, to implement after removing the dictator. The problem in Syria, and the Christians are suffering out of this problem, is that we have a, a, a regime which is bloody, which is corrupt, which built the country on hunger for power. That, that is one hand. On the other hand, we have a, this, uh, an illusioned opposition, fragmented, divided, no program, no, no, I, no plan to give to the country. Um, fighting among, among each other, uh, delusioned, they, they are outside the country, they are uh, almost detached from the people inside the country, they have offered no alternative so far, and accepted to call any gun. Somebody, in, the, in one leader in the opposition t told me, said, Father, any gun against the regime is a friendly gun for us. What a mad statement. What a mad statement. So Jabhat al-Nusra is a, a friendly gun only because they are against the regime? Al-Qaeda is legitimate only because the, it is against the regime? And the West is supporting that? This is madness. So we as Christians are in the middle of two mad parties fighting for the power in Syria, not for the people in Syria. And the Christians and other minorities and the Muslim people who want the change but not through violence, we are all paying the price, very heavy price. Very, very heavy price. It's an international game. And it's an international game played. And Syria is the theater. 
What we are looking at in Syria is the result of nations fighting with hidden agendas plus open agendas. Ideologies hidden and shown in order to seek and capture the power, the power of the chair in the country. Because of that, we say we are not letting that destroy us. We are standing together with you and with all those who believe that humanity and Christianity have value. Values for reconciliation. Values for love. We still believe in love, believe it or not. We still believe that Jesus Christ came that we may have a better life. One thing I tell you, what is happening in Syria is redefining what we call interfaith relationships. And another thing I tell you, if Christianity left the Middle East, Islam would have proven to the whole world that it is a religion that is intolerant and cannot live with a different other. And this image of Islam, neither the Christians nor the Muslims want the world to have. I look and I see the majority of Muslims in the world are silent. Yesterday I was speaking in one of the Islamic channels here in London on TV and I said to the camera and I said you Muslims you made a havoc in the world because of a pathetic film a pathetic film on YouTube that nobody saw until you highlighted it nobody even heard about that pathetic film until you made a fuss and people died, were killed, embassies were, 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 were burned down. The, the ambassador was killed, in, the, the American ambassador in, in, in Libya. Because of a pathetic film, I said, what are you doing to see minority of people, if this is really a small minority of Muslims, hijacking Islam and in the name of Islam are doing such incredible atrocities. Where are you? Why are you not raising up your voice? Why are you not standing up to these people and this minority and saying not in our name? I said as a Christian I can't tell you that. You have to do it. And if you are silent it means you are participating in the atrocities. If, I, if, I, if Christians are doing such at atrocities, my voice would be the highest voice to condemn it. And I don't hear enough Muslim voices to say to those people in Syria who are killing everybody, terrorizing the country, enough is enough. And we want to live together as we have lived, as His Grace said, for centuries The call is there, out, out there. Christians, Muslims, minorities, majorities, I don't care. What I care is that the world should break the barrier of silence and shake these politicians to put an end to a country which is on its knees. Help us to do so in any way you want. The Awareness Foundation is dedicated to help Christians in the Middle East to stay in the Middle East for the Middle East, believing we have a role there to play because we are there to stay. Thank you.